All right, welcome to biotechnology number one. Now I've edited this PowerPoint for those who have already looked at it in earlier weeks to be a little bit more succinct and specific to the syllabus dot points. So in this PowerPoint, we're really only looking at DNA sequencing, DNA profiling, and then appraising data. So this is biotechnology part one. The other part will be in the next PowerPoint, which looks specifically at recombinant DNA technology, um, as well as PCR and electrophoresis. So we're really here just focusing on the purposes of sequencing and profiling. So by the end of the lesson, you need to be able to recognize the applications of DNA sequencing to map species genomes and DNA profiling to identify unique genetic information. Now in the PowerPoint, I have shown different methods that are used here, but you can see from the dot point, it is a low level dot point, just recognizing applications. Okay, so it doesn't actually ask you to explain the processes. Um, however, PCR is a process within these two, which we do discuss in the next PowerPoint. You also need to appraise data from the outcome of a current genetic biotechnology technique to determine its success rate. It's quite hard to find examples of questions on this, um, so I've tried to put some in the questions on your OneNote as best I can to address that dot point. All right, so biotechnology is quite a big topic. It's very current at the moment because of how quickly the technology has advanced since the Human Genome Project, and it's really looking at molecular tools and techniques for manipulating DNA. Uh, for different purposes. So there's a lot of jobs in this area because it requires chemists, biologists, um, it requires engineers who can make the devices that are going to be needed to do the jobs that we want them to do. So it's a very um, interesting and upcoming field uh, because of all of the potential that it has in medicine and so forth. There's a lot of data that can come from biotechnology that has implications for all of society. So we do look at a few of the um, ethical considerations as we go through this. So bioinformatics is a pretty big heading that you would have seen in your claims for your RI. And it's basically using biological information. Because there's so much information, it uses computer programs and models. So it has to use algorithms done through on computers to organize results um, from looking at huge molecules like DNA and protein sequences. So as you know from the structure of DNA, it's a massive molecule and it used to be done by hand and it took a lot of time and effort to for scientists to work stuff out by hand but now they use high powered computers to um, pump through the large amounts of information um, in 1977 they first um, published the nucleotide sequence of a virus so it's quite recent and since then there's been a dramatic increase in the amount of public access to different dna sequences um, so we'll talk about the Human Genome Project um, and then where we're kind of going in the future with this. There's two main centers for bioscience data. You might have heard of NCBI. It's a big database where you'll see a lot of your scientific journal articles, but it's also um, a database for biotechnology um, information. Um, there's also the EMBL, the European Bioinformatics Institute. And between these, there's almost 10 million gigabytes of data, which um, is a significant amount of data that has to be stored. Um, and that's expected to accelerate as we proceed further on into genetic sequencing um, and looking at what could possibly happen in the future with um, individualized um, genetic um, advancements. So the Human Genome Project was from 1990 to 2003, so very, very recent. It was an international project and its aim was to determine the nucleotide sequence of an entire human. So even though we're all very different, humans share 99% of DNA in common. So the, the purpose of the project was to sequence that 99% similarity. Um, and then we can look at the individual differences that make us up and 
what leads to disease and all of that sort of thing. So all of the functional genes of the human genome were identified and mapped. And now that is very useful for geneticists to identify the role of different genes, to understand the biological um, processes involved in those genes, to get a better understanding of what the gene's job is, what happens when they go wrong and how they might lead to disease. So it's like a whole nother type of um, medicine rather than treating symptoms. It's looking at the genetic causes and possibly targeting um, treatments towards those genes. And that's where we're sort of heading now with CRISPR and those sorts of technologies. There's a video there that gives you a little summary of the Human Genome Project. Um, some of the examples of what they've found from this is about insulin regulation in diabetes, um, different genetic predispositions that might be around, and some of you did your RIs on that, um, different immune responses to pathogens and vaccines. So basically a lot of underlying genetic causes for different things that might go wrong in the body. So DNA sequencing is the process of determining the nucleic acid sequence of a DNA molecule. So the Human Genome Sequence Project was about finding out the, the bases, the ATCG sequence of our entire genome. So that's what DNA sequencing is referring to. If we have the entire sequence of DNA, that allows scientists to look at the genetic information that's carried in different species. We can look at why certain genes have been maintained across a variety of species because of its importance or um, the fact that multiple species might use that particular um, gene product. Um, scientists can use the information to determine which stretches of DNA contain genes that are going to create actual proteins and which might contain regulatory genes, which switch genes on and off. So we'll talk a bit about those later, but they're not necessarily going to be making a product, but they might um, instruct cells to turn on, on or off different genes. Um, we can also use sequence data to look at changes in genes that can lead to diseases. So there's a huge array of stuff that we can get from DNA sequencing. It's very high tech. Um, you can see you get some DNA from a source. Uh, and it's all done nowadays through computer technologies. So they do different lab techniques to extract the DNA um, and they're able to sort of run bulk amounts of copies of that DNA and compute it um, all done sort of through sequencing machines and that sort of thing. And then scientists can analyze it on computers. The Human Genome Project was done using chemical techniques, but then they had to visualize the bases and actually write them all out, which took a long time. DNA sequencing can also be used to look at biological relationships. So they can look at sequences of different um, species DNA and look for similarities. And we looked at this way back in earlier units. Um, and this is how they often came up with the different um, phylogenetic trees to look at species similarity. And this more up-to-date genetic data often made the trees um, have to be updated because we were basing them just on physical traits, but the genetic um, sequence information often led to changes needing to be made on these maps. Um, there is a software called BLAST. It's called Basic Local Alignment Search Tool, and it compares genome sequences so that it's actually a big database full of all the genome sequences of organisms that have been sequenced and you can play with that data to look at um, evolutionary relationships. Um, it used to all be done by hand and there was no real way of storing and making use of that information but this type of software allows geneticists and um, sort of evolutionary scientists to really make a lot of meaning from that data. This is a visualization of <clears throat> types of DNA sequencing methods. Um, PCR is a process that we're going to look at in the next lesson, um, and they can run this particular chemical technique, um, get different sequences of DNA, 
separate them using gel electrophoresis and then use a sequencing machine to spit out the DNA bases. There's nothing in the syllabus that asks you to actually explain the process of DNA sequencing. So in terms of individual people and where this sequencing technology might go, we're now looking at genetic screening, which is where doctors might recommend genetic screening to look for genetic abnormalities or disorders. Um, so it might be that there's a family history of a particular condition and you might want to have your genome screened to look for if that um, if you're carrying that gene that might be able to be passed on and so forth. Um, there's commercial companies that can sequence DNA to give you information about your ancestry. Um, there's a lot of different things that are being discussed with this sort of technology, but there's a lot of ethical considerations around that. Um, who owns that personal information? What happens to your actual genome information and that sort of thing? So you're kind of in some cases signing your DNA um, sequence away to some company that could store that and maybe use it for random things later on. Um, so these are just some of the different issues that can arise from personal data being stored in databases. So there's data mining where um, they could use your information to build up a profile of individuals once they get a whole heap of people's data um, without your consent privacy and confidentiality considerations, bias towards individuals. So maybe if you have certain predispositions, they might not give you a job because you might be going to get a disease at a young age and then they have to pay you sick leave, etc. Um, inequality and that sort of thing. Um, social stigma associated with certain genes um, and you might not even end up getting a disease from that unknowingly finding out about a disease in the family because another family has done the profile and then divulged that information to people in the family that might not have wanted to know about that. Um, so who should actually kind of know or share that information. Um, <clears throat> changing the course of evolution, altered inheritance. So I guess that's things like if you know there's a certain disease predisposition um, and you choose not to have kids, then that kind of um, alters the normal path of evolution that would happen. And if we sort of started doing that with animals and plants, we would sort of see the natural um, ratio of, um, I suppose, good and bad genes being out in the population kind of being disrupted. Um, yeah, there's also accuracy issues, so whether it's um, if we're actually getting the correct information from the sequences. And then ethical implications, so commercial exploitation of the human DNA sequence. Um, it kind of dehumanizes individual people. Um, and there's a range of different things there that you can have a look at. Bioweapons is an interesting one. Um, sequencing babies at birth to find out exactly what they're predisposed to and whether that's kind of ethical. Um, and those sorts of things. Okay, so going into DNA profiling, this is also called DNA fingerprinting. Um, and this uses um, biotechnology, again, to identify DNA from individuals or groups of individuals. It's not necessarily used to sequence that um, information, but it's more identification. Um, so it might be identifying who a DNA sample belongs to um, or look at relatedness between different samples. Um, but the technologies are very specific and sensitive nowadays. As I said before, there's a huge proportion of nucleotides that are identical among humans, but in every thousand nucleotides, there's one site of variation. And this is called a polymorphism. Um, so these sorts of things can be detected and looked at as um, areas where differences should occur and where we could identify different individuals. So we can visualize those polymorphisms and look at specific DNA fingerprints and this uses gel electrophoresis which is shown in the background there and that is the technique we're going to talk about next lesson. So DNA profiling is often used in paternity testing so that's comparing DNA of offspring against potential fathers. 
um, and that's based on the principle that children inherit half their alleles from each parent. So they should possess a combination of their parents' alleles. So you can see in the image on the right there, this is using gel electrophoresis. Um, and the bars that you see there are color coded where the child has combinations of the pink kind of color there from the mum's genes, the bluish color from the male one's genes, but they don't share any similarities to male two. So it would be expected that male one would be the father in that case. It's also used for forensic applications. So identifying suspects or identifying victims based on crime scene DNA. Um, in order for convictions to be made, the suspect DNA would have to be a complete match with the sample and there would need to be very stringent guidelines around um, the sensitivity and accuracy of those sorts of samples. We'll look at um, gel electrophoresis in more detail in the next lesson. So the key difference between DNA profiling and sequencing is DNA profiling is used to identify individuals from samples by looking at unique patterns in the DNA. DNA sequencing is used to determine the entire sequence of nucleotides in a piece of DNA. So I guess profiling is a bit more specific to those kind of areas where we're comparing DNA. Sequencing is more the entire genome for the sake of identifying mutations that could lead to disease and those sorts of things. There's a bunch of other applications of bioinformatics and these we discussed in class. Um, just some extra sort of reading that if you know what we've already discussed, then you've met that syllabus dot point. But these are just some other um, applications and we'll go through those really quickly. So molecular medicine is using <clears throat> these techniques to look at molecular structures, identify um, molecular targets for disease and look at how we can identify drugs um, targeted to specific genes. So rather than treating symptoms, looking at the genetic issues causing diseases and targeting those. Personalized treatment. So if a doctor has the genetic profile of a patient, then they would be able to prescribe medications that are appropriate to the conditions that might arise as they come. So rather than waiting for somebody to get really sick and present really bad symptoms, um, they could actually kind of get onto the disease before it takes a hold of the person um, and that way kind of manage their condition a lot better. Preventative medicine. So preventing the disease before the treatment's actually necessary. And this is what they're really trying to do with CRISPR and that type of thing is using gene therapies to actually find the gene that's causing a disease and um, alter that gene so that it um, restores normal gene expression. They've done this in 2017 with sickle cell anemia and leukemia. Um, but it's all really trials happening at the moment and it would be really expensive to get it actually happening. Microbial genome analysis. This is looking at um, DNA sequences of random bacteria that live in extreme conditions and looking at the genetic um, causes for why they have those interesting traits. So it could be cell division, like um, animals that regrow certain um, parts, um, animal or bacteria that can live in extreme temperatures or like very low depths in the ocean and that sort of thing, antibiotic resistance. So they can look at genes in those microbes and how they cause those traits. Looking at the human microbiome, so that's any microorganisms that live inside humans. And sometimes they actually look at the relationship between the microbiome and disorders, um, which is an interesting kind of link between those two areas. They can also use this sort of stuff in agriculture. And this is going more into genetic modification, looking at crops and their genomes to look for genes that might give them resistance to um, pests and that kind of thing and disease, give them more nutritional value and that type of thing. And then they can go further and look at transferring genes from all between organisms to create GMOs. Um, and 
that's a big one at the moment, looking at um, human health and improving um, food shortages around the world. CRISPR is a <clears throat> really good technology that's coming up um, and this is using um, basically it's targeting a particular gene. If you look at the image on the right, that target sequence there might be a um, gene that's causing a particular disease. You use a guide RNA that goes and binds to that target and causes it to open up. And then you have this special protein called Cas9, which binds to that guide RNA and causes cuts in that initial gene. Um, and it can either cause a mutation to the gene or they're looking at where you can actually substitute in um, genes that would correct the issue with the original gene. So it's quite clever, it's very accurate, um, and it can cut those genes at specific locations based on the genome sequence information. Um, and they've already done clinical trials in these sorts of fields. There's a lot of research out there in the use of CRISPR for um, gene therapies. There's a video there that you can have a look at for that. Okay, now the syllabus asks you to appraise biotechnology data. So basically with these different techniques, it's talking about how likely they are to succeed and the risks involved. So when it says to appraise, they want you to talk about the results, the success rates, for example, and sort of weigh that up and say whether the technique was good or not for its purpose. So it could be, it could be CRISPR data. <laughs> it could be CRISPR data or it could be um, the um, PCR and electrophoresis that we're going to look at next lesson um, or bacterial transformation next lesson. Um, so it might ask you to sort of weigh up whether the risks outweigh the benefits with the technology. Um, you would be given data <clears throat> and asked to appraise the success rate of that. Um, so I'll give you some examples now. Here's an example looking at trials in China recently. They used eggs that were discarded from IVF clinics and they inseminated them with um, diseased sperm. They knew that they were genetically diseased. And then they used CRISPR to try and repair the faulty gene. In the table, you can see there's two different mutations that are shown. There's the G1376T. They trialed it on two embryos and using CRISPR, one embryo, it corrected the gene and one embryo, it created a mosaic, which means there was a correct and an incorrect copy. Now, if you were appraising that, you would say that that's not too bad of a result because in 50% of the cases, it completely corrected the gene. And in 50%, it had some benefit, but some sort of not, not being corrected at all. So it's promising. It also only had two trials. So it's not a great overview of sort of what you'd expect in a proper trial, but it is promising. The second gene is the beta 4142 mutation. They use four embryos. In one embryo, it didn't correct it and it introduced a new mutation, which is not ideal. One embryo had mosaic again and two embryos, there was no change. So in none of these cases was the technology successful. So in appraising that particular trial, I would say that that was not effective and you wouldn't use that trial as a good indication of the use of this technology for that gene. Here's another one <clears throat> looking at transgenic cotton. So a common biotechnology application in agriculture is putting pesticides into cotton using agrobacterium. So some of you have heard of the BT cotton in your RIs. Um, very few cells will actually accept the genetic material delivered by the bacterium and insert it into its genome. Um, and when they do, it's called transgenic uptake. So you would expect that if you introduce this bacteria into the crop, you would the crop would take up the gene for natural pesticides and therefore you would get more cotton yield because it's not being attacked by the pests. So in the data here, you've got BT cotton crops when attacked um, by these insects that normally attack the cotton. 
It's got three different paddocks and it's got three trials. The first two trials have got BT cotton and the third trial is a control where they didn't use BT cotton. So you can compare it to that. So paddock one, we had 643 plants without insect attack. Trial two, 469, and that's comparing to the control of 484. So from that, we can see trial one had a lot more plants that weren't attacked, but trial two was less, so that's not ideal. For paddock two, it was 655 and 427 compared to 456 in the control. And trial three was 702 and 525 compared to 402. So trial three was a lot more promising because both, sorry, paddock three was a lot more promising because trial one and trial two were both higher than the control. But for paddocks one and two, only trial one were effective, not trial two. So that's kind of how you would go about appraising that data. Looking at the means, both means from trial one and trial two are higher than the control, but I would be suggesting more trials would need to be done since there's such a difference between um, trials two and trials one, and there's quite a high standard deviation there as well. Okay, so when you're appraising, it's almost like what you would do when you're evaluating your own results or um, secondary data in a student experiment or an RI. You're really just pulling it apart and talking about um, the quality of that data. Okay, so overall, you need to recognize the applications of DNA sequencing and DNA profiling and appraise data from biotechnology techniques to determine success rates. Now, the syllabus guidance notes say that examples for species genome mapping could be the Human Genome Project and the BLAST database, which we talked about. Current biotechnology techniques could include gel electrophoresis, PCR, or CRISPR. So they're some of the ones that they might give you data on. Um, and data for appraisal could be from DNA banding, DNA fragment frequencies, effectiveness of restriction enzymes, location of genes. Um, and that's probably more relevant to what we're going to look at next lesson. There's some click views there that you can have a look at if you like, and that will also lead you into the next lesson. That's it for biotechnology number one.